All right, so I'm live tonight with Victor Tay from Sydney, Australia. He is the pastor at the church in Punchbowl. And um, we're going to have a little bit of a, of, a de- of a debate tonight, but really more of an informal debate as, as we kind of discuss behind the scenes, more of a conversation really in terms of the Trinity and some of the controversy surrounding the Trinity. And, you know, when we're, t- you know, like we've seen things like oneness and modalism and different branches of what I consider to be the same error or heresy. Um, whereas, you know, Victor Tay has a very different outlook on that. And, um, you know, I, I just want to start with the fact that, you know, I just want to tell people we are pretty much aligned in the fundamentals of the faith things like that Jesus is God, that the written word of God in the King James is the final authority, at least in the English and the King James is the final authority on all matters. Um, you know, that we, we agree in once on once saved, always saved, grace through faith, all kinds of stuff that we're pretty much aligned on in doctrine. Uh, but we do have a major difference in, in the way that we understand and view the nature of God. And, you know, we're talking about the triune nature of God as, as the, the way that I would describe it, the, uh, the Trinity, the orthodox view of, of the Trinity, the biblical, what I consider the be, to be the biblical view of the Trinity. Um, and so, you know, we have different understanding of that. We're going to have some of that discussion. And uh, we each have, have about three or, four, three or four different main points that we want to make, but we'll see how many we can get through tonight. And... Um, I'll just throw one out to to Victor Tay to start, and um, maybe you know if you want to just kind of give us like a three to four minute or so you know synopsis of your views and and uh, ask me any questions that that you may have, and then I'll go to my topics with with you as well. Sure, no problem. <laughs> I think one one uh, just small note of correction in your introduction is I I don't see uh, I mean. If you understand the Trinity with the Orthodox view, I don't see our views as being that different. And that's sort of the point I've tried to make throughout this whole controversy is I don't think the different views that are being expressed are all that different. I think there is a lot of misunderstanding and misrepresentation uh, going on. And I do see it as just slight or minor differences of understanding uh, not to the point where we have different gods and different Jesus. And I think this is where I disagree, where people are saying, well, you have a different view of how to understand how God is one, how God is three, and therefore you have a totally different view. Now, I don't accept all views, obviously, because I think there is a point where when Jesus loses the deity of Christ, uh, you know, the deity, uh, his deity, then he's no longer you know, the God that we worshipped. And I, and I think that's what makes Jesus another Jesus, is when he's no longer God. And that is often the reason why we don't like how um, I, I, generally when we think of people that deny the Trinity, we're thinking of people that deny the fact that Jesus is God because these three are not one. So we don't like, you know, Trinity deniers in the sense that we don't like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses And the reason why it's a big deal is because they deny the deity of Christ, not because they just have a different understanding of how God is three and how God is one's one and the terminology that they use. So just that's just a just a brief thing at the beginning there. But to give you a a brief synopsis of of how I view um, the Godhead, I do see it as a paradox. I think you've you've got friends that probably see it the same way where, you know, I I do accept that there are three persons within the Godhead, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, but these three are also one. Now, I know the Orthodox view of the Trinity says they're just one in essence or one in being. They they share a substance, but I believe the Scriptures teach that they are are more, they are one in a way that that is more than just a shared attribute. Um, And this is why we see you know, I'm sure verses we'll discuss today, like Isaiah 9, 6, you know, 1 John 3 talks about and almost interchanges, you know, the Father, the Son manifesting in the flesh and he died for our sins and things like this. Even in the Bible, we see, you know, you say that you don't blend the persons. And I understand that there's the, the distinction remains, but there are a lot of verses that are hard to explain if those distinctions don't get blurred, like in Romans 8, the fact that there's one spirit one God and and just numerous mentions of a singular person pronoun used to refer to the being of God. So 
That's what I want to make clear is uh, I think people have misunderstood my position because I, I argue in a sense for both positions because I believe the oneness view is half right. And I believe the Orthodox Trinitarian view is half right. And it, it's like people like to put you in these two camps. They'll ask you, are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? And it's like, well, there's not only two options. You know, there, there right. could be a blend of the two. And that's the biblical position. And mm -hmm. this is how I see the Trinity, that, um, you know, people in the new IFB movement have created this d divide amongst people that are similar to us. And they say, you're either oneness Pentecostal well, me, or you are you Orthodox Trinitarian. And I think there's an element of truth in both. All right. Let me just stop you there, if you don't mind, for a minute, sure. just for you know, for the sake of time. Um, we've got, you know, um, I think that I've, I've been listening to some of your other sermons and watching, um, you know, I kind of checked out what you believe in terms of this doctrine, because I knew we we're speaking. And I do get a sense of that, that you feel like you're misunderstood and that you're, you know, your position is misunderstood. And that really, I think the crux of it, though, um, while I agree, you know, we all affirm that Jesus is God. And I know people who I believe are saved who are who have fallen for oneness or have fallen into modalism, or maybe they were always that way. Because like yourself, you, you said you've always believed that the father that Jesus is the Father, you know. And I believe that's one of the fundamental errors, you know, that that you're making. Because well, I, I, think I would just I would just clarify that option is is I do believe in one sense Jesus is the Father, because in their oneness they are one. But then there's the paradox of the fact that they are three as well. So I understand that the word is distinct from the Father, is distinct from the Holy Spirit. So right. that's why and it's I, both. So that's I, why I, when, I, you, yeah, when, you, when you say people are believing oneness, it, it just depends what you mean by that. Because I think they, they acknowledge that, you know, maybe the oneness view has certain elements that are correct, but it, it doesn't mean that they believe everything and it depends how you define oneness and modalism as well. well and because that, that's a part of it is I don't necessarily believe that you're you're into the, <clears throat> in the camp. Um, I definitely don't believe you're in the Orthodox Trinity camp either, though. And that's sort of yeah. what I want to get right. to a little bit is that um, really the crux of it of your view, I believe, where where a part of the, the issue begins is that your claim is that God is not paradoxical. Um, is paradoxical. That, that he is paradoxical. Yeah. The Trinitarian position, and my position as well, is that God is a God of logic and reason and math and mm -hmm. science, and he is the God of, you know, uh, he is not paradoxical, in other words. So, so the whole crux of your position seems to come to that three equals one is what you ultimately say. And, I, you know, from watching your sermons that both three and one are true at the same time. Yeah. And... That, so I can I understand your position. I don't think that's that's completely oneness, uh, but I think the the uh, the the fact is that there is a, a third camp, which is modalism, which uh, seems to be where I think your views kind of fit closer into. Now you can explain. One of my questions for you, for example, was um, how are you different than a modalist, for example? Because they believe God is mm -hmm. one who manifests and appears as three, right, in three different forms. And I've, you know, in your sermons, you've said that God is manifests as the Son, God manifests as the Father. So you have been using modalist uh, terminology to describe your views. Would you say you're a modalist? Sorry, is the question is, would I say I'm a modalist? Well, it depends how yeah, you define sure. modalism. How I've understood modalism is that God goes from one mode to the next and cannot be all three at the same time. Is that how you understand modalism? Not exactly, I suppose, but that does make sense. That's probably fairly accurate. Um, but it's, it's basically the idea that God is one God who comes in three different forms in different times of history, like during the incarnation, for example, he came as the son and, and things like that. Whereas Trinitarians, you know, we believe that God was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost from all eternity yeah. as three distinct, co-equal, co-substantial persons, as you know. Yeah, you but know, do, you understand, do you understand modalism to believe that, the, for example, the Holy Spirit and the Father, can, they, they coexist at the same time? Or can, can God only be the Father or the Holy Spirit? No, I, I don't Which know one if, do you, if cause cause I've spoken theory. to different people and they define it differently. So before we say, um, am I a modalist or not? You know, I don't, I don't agree with that view. I don't agree that God can only be one 
at any one time. I do believe that God is all three at the same time. So if if that's modalism, if that's defined as modalism, then a, a part of my view does agree with that, that there is one God who is all three. But then I also acknowledge, like I said, my view is paradoxical in the sense that God is also three persons. So where I disagree with a purely oneness person is that they deny that God can be three persons. So I, I believe that he is, because I do believe the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are three distinct persons, but at the same right. time, they're one person. So it's like they don't they don't go to that degree. They'll just say that it's three natures of the one person, or it's just three you know, manifestations of the one person. But each of those... You know, and I know manifestations kind of became a buzzword in this old controversy, but the way I think of it is the way God, the way we know him, the way he's told us about him. Um, so I do believe that there's one God that is all three, but at the same time, right. these three are with each other and we can see that there is a distinction in person. Uh, so I, I don't think it's, un whilst I, I, whilst I agree with you that the scriptures should be logical and reasonable, reasonable, I don't think it's unreasonable to believe God can exist in a paradox because he's outside of our logical realm. So when we talk about things to do with us, yeah, you know, we, we can't be saved by grace and by works. That would, that would be a, a, a paradox that goes against Scripture because the Bible says we're saved by grace, not of works. But when it comes to God's nature, like we would, we would think that God being both 100% man and 100% God is a paradox too. Because how can how can an infinite, omnipresent being be limited in one place? How can a how can a all powerful being you know require sustenance? You know how can he not know, know everything? So this is a this is a paradox just, just that is explained by these two things. Yeah, and I Sorry, see. Just to I'll just end it here, bit, it's, and I, so I would see much, uh, the same with the three persons and one person. It's a paradox that explains right. the apparent contradiction. You know, in the right. Bible. And just to interject, because there's a lot of material there. So, and I want to respond to some of it before we go off sure. into a lot of other things. But I think I understand your position. I think you're, you've clarified it, you know, pretty well. Um, I would say, though, that, you know, and I understand the, the, you know, when you say that God can be paradoxical because he's outside of logic and reason, I think that's a fair point. I'm not, you know, but I yeah, don't so he's like reason. He's reasonably paradoxical. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting point you make, but I don't I don't know if it's necessarily true. But I get the logic of of what you're saying by that. But I think a part of it comes down to you know your understanding of the word one in these passages, like John ten thirty and First John five seven. You know, mm -hmm. I and my Father are one, and these three are one, right? And so you have a an understanding of one that is different than mine. You know, the way that I explain it is that according to the scriptures, not our own philosophy, but according to the scriptures, mm -hmm. um, what we see is that, you know, one here is speaking quant uh, qualitatively, not quantitatively. You know, whereas you, t you appear to be interpreting it quantitatively as a numerically, I'm seeing it as qualitatively speaking of God's nature and his essence and his substance that they are all of one, you know, one material in essence, you know, their essence is one, one thing. So in that sense, they're, they're one, but God himself has existed in three different personages or entities or however you want to, you know, explain it by our, by our human logic. It's, it's that they have an individuality within each three persons, you know, and they have their own will. Uh, as we see in other scriptures where God says, you know, where, where the Lord Jesus says, you know, not my will, but thine be done, right? So we see there are two wills there. Um, and so I, I think we agree that there are three and they're one. It's just I, what, I'm, what I don't see is the, the paradoxical nature of it. You know, I don't think it has to be yep. a paradox. It's that there's three persons who exist in one Godhead. And that's the orthodox position for what two thousand years. So why, or you know, and you could debate whether it's eighteen hundred or seventeen hundred years. But that has been the the you know the uh, the accepted view by the vast majority of Bible believing Christians throughout the ages since the inception of the church. So it's either my understanding from from watching you before was that you're either uh, going to have to go towards modalism 
to explain your views or perhaps uh, worse is that you've come up with a new doctrine um, because I don't know anybody else that believes this the way you do. Now, that doesn't necessarily... I thought you mean, had friends that believed like this. Like this. Um, I mean, I think I've, I've, I've had one friend who believed like this. I, I've had a lot of people fall into, into oneness, uh, what I do consider heresy. I mean, I do think the oneness view is heresy. I don't know if you're completely oneness. Well, you maybe know, I can, if I can really, touch on... Because I, I think we're, we're going think to we're a few different... Yeah, I can hear some feedback, eh? So maybe you have... Do you, but you don't hear... I've never muted you, so you can't hear feedback when, when I talk. It must, be, it must no. be when you use headphones. Anyways, let me, let me, let me just, uh, just uh, talk about the whole, that whole, um, you know, I and my father are one before we get on to different topics because th there's a few topics you've brought up as well too. But I, I don't think it's that you see them as uh, one in unity and I see them as one in person only. Because like I said, my view, I, I, I take both positions because I, I don't think God is limited to just one side of the equation. Like God doesn't only have to be three persons and therefore can't be one person, uh, or God is one person and therefore can't be three persons because God doesn't have to fit inside what we can logically understand him. Uh, and I think you understand that reasoning, right? So he can be both three and one person and therefore anything that can be understood in light of three persons, he can be. And, and there are things that can be understood in light of one person where I think the Trinity is not willing to go to that side because they want to keep them separate and just say they're one in unity. So when Jesus says, I and my Father are one, I don't deny the fact that Jesus is also one in unity with his Father. Uh, and that's why we can say as we are one because we're in unity too. We're not each other. But I think the way Jesus is one with the Father goes beyond that. It goes beyond just one in unity because if we just understand that there are two persons, they're just two persons in unity and they're never each other. Oh, your video just went out, by the way. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard um, you explain that, you know, uh, you know, the Father, the, the Word and the Holy Ghost are one in the sense that, you know, uh, you and your wife are one. And, and, and you would know that that analogy breaks down in the sense exactly. that there are two. No, yeah, yeah. I, I'd have to clarify that because okay, that's so not maybe, exactly. Because yep. a lot but, of people would use that analogy to explain, oh, you know, they're not actually the one person. It's just like, ah, uh, you know, the people at Babel, you know, we're one. And, and, you know, it's just like the church is one. And, you know, two people in a well, marriage, they're one. Okay. So I, I, get, I get that point. they're making the point that they're one in unity. But I think it goes beyond that. If I can just finish this point, then you can respond. I, I believe it goes beyond that because, you know, you can't say if you've seen me, you've seen that other person, right? You can't say if you've seen me, you've seen my wife. You, you can't say, like, if I say I'm one with my wife, you wouldn't accuse me of being my wife. Whereas when Jesus said he, he was one with the Father, they accused him of being God. So if, if they're two different people, then how, how does that work? And you can't say... Um, you know, like Jesus says, for example, I think it's in uh, John 6 or John 5, I'd have to look it up, where he says, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he says things like, you know, the things that I that say, you know, it's not, it's not me that does it, it's the Father that's doing it. So, I mean, I couldn't say things like that if I'm just in unity with somebody else. I couldn't say, hey, the things that I'm doing, and when you believe on me, it's not actually me doing it or you believing on me, it's actually them. Okay. So yeah. I understand your point. Just to respond to some of that, I mean, I, it almost seems like partly it's semantics, but it's not completely because I believe there's that one essence of God, okay? And within that one essence exists the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you know, and those, the three are the one essence, you know, they make, they make up the one essence, the one substance, the one nature, but so I don't know if it's partly semantics here. At play partially, but I don't think it is completely. No, no, no. But I don't think it's. Verses, oh, sorry. Well, let me get the verse out real quick. When when we get to verses like John seventeen, mm -hmm. uh, twenty one, uh, this is how I begin to understand the word one, because yeah. we're talking about I and my Father are one, right? Mm -hmm. And then this is that passage where you said, "If you've seen me, I've seen the you've seen the Father." But he explains what he means by that because he goes to John seventeen twenty one and he says that they all may be one speaking of the church, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is praying that we be one as, as the church, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, 
that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one, mm-hmm. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. So what we're seeing here is he's praying for the church, for the individual members, the living mm-hmm. stones, which make up the body of Christ, right? Yep. And he's saying, they may be one mm-hmm. as we are one. Yeah. Now, I am never going to be one with my with my uh, friends or other brothers in Christ in the sense that you're describing it in the sense of being one person. Yeah, you know, exactly. we're never gonna be one person. So when mm-hmm. you apply that to the understanding of the word one in John ten thirty and first John five seven, you you see then that he's not talking about becoming one person or being or even being one person. He's speaking again qualitatively about the essence and the nature of God, which is you know that we all may be one as as you know he is one with the Father. They're one in, in they're individuals just like we are within the church, but they're one in essence and, and in substance. But they always yeah. retain their distinction. At, always. Like they can't, if they're one at the same time as three, then they've lost that distinction during that moment. Yeah, and that's where I think we disagree is um I, I, I don't think it's an issue of semantics. I don't think we disagree in how they're three. I think we both acknowledge that there are three persons. It's just in 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 their oneness. Do they lose those distinctions? That's really where we disagree, and I think that's what I've sort of figured out with other people that I disagree with as well. Is I acknowledge that the distinctions are still there, in the sense. So if you, if you imagine, if we go back to that three equals one equation, right? On the three side, that's where I see the distinctions. The fact that God is three persons. That's where we agree. When we move over to the one, how God is one, you maintain the distinctions, and that's where I believe. If the distinctions, if the distinction, if what, if the dis, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here, but if if the distinctions that made them three are maintained on the one side, then what makes them one? Because it's the distinctions that made them three. So when we move over to the one side and we say there's one God, that's why we see an overlap in the persons in the Bible in certain scriptures. So I don't deny that, hey, you can read John 17 and know that God is three persons and therefore there's a unity between the three persons and that's the unity that that we can share. So that's how we are one. But I can't say, like, let's say we were in the same church, right? I can't say if you've seen me, you've seen Afshin. I can't say, you know, if the things that I'm doing, it's actually Afshin doing it. And, and, and Victor can't be called the Afshin. And nobody, and when I say, you and I are one, and I'm talking about unity, nobody would say, you know, you being Victor, maketh, maketh yourself action. So that's why I'm saying, like, I, I understand that there is a, a unity between the three persons, but I also believe it transcends that. It goes beyond that because Jesus, when he said, I and my father are one, yes, he was in unity with his father, but at the same time, he was the father. So I think it's, it's both there. So I think... Okay. I think so I think the reason why maybe you're finding it hard to to grasp is you, you're still thinking it must I, be I one or the it. other. It's like if somebody was saying, "No, no, you you just have to believe on Jesus as a free will," and you're like, "Well, you, you can't be a Calvinist." But then there are certain you know three four point Calvinists or something right. like that. I mean, I understand, one or the other. I understand. I understand the position, and I, <clears> I think there's like I said, I think there it's it's an interesting view. I don't think it's completely unreasonable. It's nothing I've heard before. That's why I can't quite put it into the oneness camp or the modalist camp. So, so you've either come up with a new doctrine, which is a red flag, you know, to, to a large extent, or you've hit on something that no one else has hit on, and you're like the next Isaac Newton of, of, of the Christian world. <laughs> well, I don't think you know, I'm the so, first one. I don't think I'm the first right, one I mean, to believe I'm, it, because I actually right, actually well, learned this from I actually learned I'm this from Stephen kidding, Anderson. But, <laughs> so, um, you well, know, like my, I know, the view I mean, that I take. Fairness, let me uh, let me defend yeah, yeah. Uh, the great Stephen Anderson for a minute. You know, because I, I have no reason to do so. You know, really, but um, but I will. So it, I, I think there are times when you do misspeak. Uh, you know, in sermons or let, another thing was there 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 are certain issues like the Trinity where we haven't thought about it to the extent mm-hmm. that we've been forced now to think about it since these yeah. you know issues have come up. And so, you know, if you look at pre this issue at people's semantics and language and understanding, 
certainly there's going to be some things that you go, oh man, why did I say that? You know, uh, and that's just a, the nature of, of, you know, I have like a million plus words online in, in different sermons. <laughs> We're going to say different things that we yeah. don't, you know, so I don't think he, I think he does pretty much take the orthodox position. Um, but I guess my question to you would be then in Genesis 126, where God said, let us make man in our image, that's speaking of eternity past, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, God himself. Well, it's talking was, about in the beginning. Eternity, of course. So yeah. has he existed paradoxically from before time began, according to your view? Yeah, yeah. So it's just like it lines up with John 1, 1. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning, the Word was both with and was God at the same time. Can I just uh, can I just address can I just address uh, can I just address a point before we move on? Um, I just sure. wanted because the first one I the first thing I wanted to bring up with you and and you were you were sort of alluding to it when you're saying, oh, you know, nobody's believed this for thousands of years and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm I'm sure that we would both agree that because you, because you're King James only, I don't think we would disagree on how we believe about the King James, the perfect translation. You know, it's the Word of God in English. And it's our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So, you know, whilst I understand we can discuss, you know, church history and we can discuss, you know, what the new IFB believes and all this sort of stuff, to me it's 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 still these issues are irrelevant to what is true because the only thing that is true is the word of God. So, you know, we can talk about, oh, you know, you're the only one that's believed this, which I don't think I am. I'm don't I don't think I'm the only one that's believed this. Um but to me, okay. it's irrelevant to the argument because to me, it just comes down to what scriptures teach, not what the majority or what old Christians have believed before. Right. And, and I guess this, I would disagree that nobody's address, ever believed this. Let me address this real quick because, again, there's, there's so much that we don't want to forget. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, because this brings in orthodoxy, you know, and that was one of your questions that you, you, t you said you wanted to talk about. So when it comes to Christian orthodoxy, you know, I personally begin with the orthodox position as, as the default, because I don't think I'm smart enough. And, you know, I'm so smart that I need to go back and, you know, and just ignore what anyone else has said in the past, you know, for, and it's been accepted for thousands of years. And then I'm, it's just me and the word, you know, it's not like that. I mean, the reality is I'll start with you know, I lean on the shoulders of the of the godly men that came before me who have studied this topic out for, you know, I mean, they've had, you know, debates at times in history where intellectual learning was, was you know, uh, quite burgeoning compared to, you know, the way it is today. So, you know, I don't throw out orthodoxy. Now, it's not that, but I'm not Roman Catholic in the sense that, you know, I'm going to just throw out um, I'm going to just rely on orthodoxy no matter what. I mean, if you can show me from the word of God something that goes against orthodoxy, then I will, I will you know, uh, reject orthodoxy in that sense if it's proven from the word of God. But I think that's very, um, it's just a red flag when you do go against orthodoxy, not of the Roman Catholic Church, but of Christendom, Bible-believing, born-again type Christendom as a whole. So in that sense, you know, would you say you're going against the grain of what th Christians have taught for thousands of years? Or is this something that, you know, you believe is, is traditional or orthodox? Well, that's why I don't. Oh, sorry. That's why I, I, I think what old Christians believed is irrelevant to what the scriptures teach. And I think if you start going down that, down, going down that path, so, you know, to me, it's irrelevant whether you lean on what you de define as orthodoxy, because ultimately, if the scriptures contradict that or orthodoxy, you're going to go with the scriptures, right? So, Amen. yeah, and I think it's the same, you know, in any any doctrine, you know, the scriptures ultimately is the final authority. Um, you know, it's irrelevant. You know, I'm not saying we throw it away. I think it's an interesting discussion to see. And I think people did believe different things. You know, like even when you say people have believed this for thousands of years, I don't think that's a true statement because who were they condemning? You know, obviously they were fighting with people from the very beginning. So people obviously had a different point of view. It's just that, you know, the dominant point of view became written down in history where the people who differed were segregated to the realms of being but heretics and whatnot. 
But the, 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 the logic point... of that, real quick, before we move, move away from that, the logic yeah. of that is that I, I understand what you're saying, but the logic is that 2000 years of accepted doctrine, the dominant, the dominant accepted doctrine by the vast majority of all Bible believing Christians has been wrong. Is that, I mean, that would be the end logic of what you're saying. Is that, is that, would but, you but say? Think that about this. Think about this, um, Afshin. Like, you know, we're not Catholics, you know, and I don't determine what I believe based on the majority. So, you know, millions of people could believe something false and it wouldn't faze me because at the end of the day, I determine my doctrine by scripture. Now, if you start going down the path of, you know, trying to reason like, oh, but so many Christians have believed this for thousands of years, you know, what's next? Are you going to start believing in baptismal regeneration? Well, because you know, all I these church fathers, great. if you think about action, all these church fathers that you're quoting, a lot of them taught baptismal regeneration too, but you reject that. So, so at the end of the day, right. you're still going with the scripture over, it doesn't matter how many, you know, people thought that there was only one church, Catholic church or yeah. baptismal I mean, we, regeneration. Ultimately, we go with the scripture. Ultimately. So it's no different with the Trinity. You know, it's the same. That's what no, I mean. I, it's the I same agree. premise. Just, it's the word of God. Victor, I, I agree. I'm just saying, you know, obviously the, the written word of God is the final authority. We all agree on that. So, you know, that's not the question. It's just that the implication of your doctrine is that the Bible believing, it's just a fact then, you know, that Bible believing Christians for at least as far as I've been, I've known, I've been alive, you know, and, and we know well, well, well before that. I mean, we have historical writings that the dominant view has been for at least, you know, 15 to 1800 years or 1700 years that the doctrine of the Trinity has been accepted by the vast majority now i understand okay you know it's not we don't go by the vast majority but the exactly. implication it's just simply a fact then if your view is right that yeah. all those christians have been wrong you know yeah, all i don't this have time. a problem with that because if that's what if that, that's what the script they, like if that's what, what the scripture they, teaches uh, like if we if we debate over what the scripture actually teaches and we say hey this is what the scripture actually teaches and the majority was wrong then so be it it's the same with baptismal regeneration. If we look at the scriptures and water baptism does not wash away sin, then the majority of Christians were wrong. That's why to me, what they believed was irrelevant because they don't determine truth. We need to judge what their opinions were on, by the truth, which is the word of God. Right. I mean, I, I think in a general sense, we can agree, you know, because the, the word is the final authority. I'm just making yeah. a, a different point, but let's move on to... So I, think um, we, I think we do agree on that point, and that's where I would see your appeal to I orthodoxy do, as inconsistent, because we do both I, agree that the scriptures yeah, is I mean, the not final complete, authority. Not completely, not completely, because I okay. understand, like, we agree generally, it's just that I'll start with... Uh, you know, the, the orthodox view as sort of, uh, you know, at least what I know as a born again Christian, since I've been taught, you know, from the, let's say the 1990s, when, when I got saved, that was when I, I got laid a, a strong foundation in the fundamentals in, you know, the word of God and the, in the Trinity, the three persons, this is what I've been taught. And I'm not saying that that necessarily is what makes it right. But I'm going to start with that position unless it can be shown to me from the scriptures that it's wrong. And it hasn't been shown to me thus. Now, I think some of your philosophical arguments, I think you've made some strong philosophical arguments here. I haven't seen it completely defined from the word of God. I think there are a couple of verses where you yeah, post. Well, we haven't got into that yet. So uh, can you just try mute and unmute your microphone? Because your microphone's coming through to me as like a little staticky. Okay, so it's muted right. I'm going to mute it right after this and let me know if that works. All right, try again. I'm unmuted now. Yeah, I'm muted. It's, I don't know whether it's just me then. I'm hearing you as uh, a bit like it's here's, I can hear you like there's static. It's not clear. So, oh, okay. Is it really uh, bad or is it, can we continue or is it's, it? It's pretty bad. Yeah. I don't know if uh, everyone online is hearing it. Maybe you can send a message. Can you send a message out to the live audience yeah, and ask them if they're yeah. hearing it like that? So, yeah, I think that's the difference. I, I, I don't discount orthodoxy in the sense that, you know, it's, it's interesting to know what people have believed throughout the ages, but ultimately that doesn't determine our position. And I think that's what you, you would agree with too. So using it as an appeal to somehow... 
uh, prove a position is just irrelevant. You know, you can start there and say, right. well, I don't know. So I'm, that's yeah. going to be my default position. And I have no problem with that. Of, yeah. But it's just yeah, that ultimately it comes yeah. down to what does the scriptures teach? And if the scriptures teach it, then if the majority have the wrong default position, then we throw it out. That's how I see it. Right. Can you, is, are you hearing me any better now? No, it's still the same. Okay, let me... Hopefully it's not me. <laughs> is, that, is that any better? Can you hear but I that? Just, I, the reason why I wanted to start with that is because... Oh, honey. I just want to make sure that we are using this internal microphone built in. All right, can you hear me? I can. It's still the same. I wish you could. It's hear still it. the same. So just the uh, bad audio quality. No, uh, it's well, just it's how it's coming through. I mean, I can still understand you, but it's coming through as as okay. All broken so. Up. We're going to have to run with it then. Uh, let me check on the Hangout because I do want to respond to some of that. Let me just see if I can get onto the chat here and see if it's just you're hearing it that way or if it's other people as well. So uh, if you guys in the chat, if uh, you can to give me a test of, of my just see audio quality there. Did you All just right. hear yourself come back out? Uh, so I'm just going to the chat. Can, if you guys in the chat can just kind of post if, um, if the audio, okay. So if people are saying my voice is clear, so I'm going to yeah, go. So it must be and, me then. Uh, it might just be on your end. So let me, so let's just continue. Um, you know, I guess, so I'm not sure exactly where we left off. I got a little distracted by that, but you know, why don't we just, if you don't mind, I'll just jump to one of my questions for you here. And one of those things is the hierarchy within the Godhead. You know, when we look at things like 1 Corinthians 15, 27 through 28, for example, you know, it says, for he hath put all things under his feet, speaking of God, the father, putting all things under the feet of Jesus. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him, meaning that God, the father is accepted from being put under the authority of the son, Jesus Christ. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So there's a hierarchy, a chain of command within the uh, the Godhead or the you know the Trinity. So would you say? Um, how, do you explain that? Because one of my concerns is: Are you just going to explain everything with both are true, or or you know do do any of these um, verses have any kind of impact on how you understand you know the, the, your doctrine? Because how, how do you explain that chain of command then within the Trinity? If God is one, yeah. How do I explain? Yeah. Well, that's why I, I, I don't think you can still hear me, right? I yeah. can. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't see why it's a problem to say, well, both are true. If I do believe both are true, so if if there is a chain, I do believe there's a chain of command within the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But I also think that there are passages that are better explained between the distinction between humanity and deity. So I think there are a lot of passages like this one, for example, is, is this one talking about the first person of the Trinity giving authority to the second person of the Trinity? I, that's how exactly. you would explain it, right? But, or is I it that there is a man, Christ Jesus, who's been given authority? So I think it can be understood that way as well, because I mean, this passage is about the death, burial and resurrection. You wouldn't say that. You know, we wouldn't say that God died in that sense. God was able to die because he became flesh, right? Well, I don't believe that So that this passage is about, I mean, this is 1 Corinthians 15, right? This is the gospel, the right. death, burial, the bodily burial, and the bodily resurrection. And this is the man that's being talked about. And this is the man that's being given authority. And then it's manifested that one is going to give the authority back right. to God. That, that um, does I, don't, to I don't know that whether it, this passage can only, whether you could strongly argue that it's only talking about the two persons within the Trinity or whether it's humanity and deity. I, I'd say that it's right. more strongly so, argued that. So uh, you're that, really that cutting out, Afshin. Just is, is there a way, can I restart it and come back? Because I, I want to see if like my... Yeah, on your side, yeah. Why don't you, uh, if you have the link, just restart and yeah, come back. It's getting pretty, I'll just yeah. check if some like, maybe my kids are watching YouTube videos or something. And yeah, my internet. It up. Just one second. Yeah, hold I'll that, just hold kinda, that thought. I'll wait for you. I'll just kind of 
if I leave and come back, will I still be in the Hangout? Yeah, you, you'll just just jump back in into the same link after okay. you restart like you did initially, and you'll come right back in. So that might be a all right. So while Victor is out uh, now, let's really talk about him. No, okay, so I'm just kidding, but um, so I'll just kind of you know maybe share some of my views on on the orthodoxy of, of the Trinity while while Victor is out. So I think, and then we'll let Victor respond when he gets back, but. Um, so when it comes to the hierarchy within the Godhead, uh, I do believe, you know, the Trinitarian view is that it's, you know, this is the father putting his, his, uh, giving all authority to the son himself being accepted, meaning he's the only exception and that he's, you know, that Jesus then gives everything back to the father so that the son and the father are all, all in all, but that shows the chain of command or the hierarchy within the, the Godhead. The Trinitarian view, you know, it sees this as the first person of the Godhead, the Father, the second person of the Godhead, the Son, and the third person, by implication, of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father and is sent from the, you know, and proceeds from through, through that relationship, I believe, between the Father and, and the Son. So, Victor, you're back. Uh, I was just giving people a little bit of what the Orthodox position of that first Corinthians, first Corinthians uh, 15 passages. Can you hear me better? Oh, he dropped out again. All right, so, um, so that's the orthodox position. What Victor is saying is, is, and I'm gonna ask him this question if we get the opportunity here, if he can come back, but um, what, what he seems to be saying is that, you know, this is speaking of the humanity of, of, the, of the Godhead, putting all things, giving authority to the, to the Father and to the the whole of the Godhead, I, I get. It. I mean, we can let him explain it better, but I don't believe that's the case. I believe that is a modalist view. I uh, that is, I think that's one of the ways that modalism explains it is that God manifests as the Son, and so it's the humanity of Jesus, the incarnation of God, that uh, is expressed in in that way. So uh, you know, I wait for him to answer because he had to take off. Um, and uh, hopefully, okay, you're back. Can you hear me, Victor? Ah, that's better. I don't know what. Is that better? So I, I think just it's just technical gave thing on my summary. side. I basically gave a summary of the Orthodox position of First Corinthians 15, explaining the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as the as the first, second, and third persons of of the you know of the Blessed Trinity, the Godhead. Yeah. And, uh, and then I explained that your position appears to be, now you said, you know, maybe oneness aren't wrong and everything, you know, but in terms of modalism, this does appear to be, from what I've read about modalism, that they believe that these passages and even the incarnation of, of the Son is explained in his humanity. And so uh, some of like what you said, I think that is classic modalism. And that was my, my concern of how do you ultimately uh explain the end logic of what you believe is it one god who appears as three you're saying they just always existed as three in one in a paradoxical state mm -hmm. it's kind of it's it's kind of mind-boggling i don't know and I don't, I don't i think philosophically it's kind of an interesting thing to think about but yeah well i think I it's mind-boggling that uh god was manifest in the flesh i don't think any of us disagree that this is uh as a great mystery that has plenty of controversy that goes with it but you, but even you, you would you would acknowledge the distinction between humanity and deity, even within the second person of the Trinity. You'd say that that's why Jesus needed to pray, that's why he hungered, that's why he didn't know everything. You know, so there, there. Even you would acknowledge that there is a distinction between his humanity and his deity, and he was both one hundred percent man and one hundred percent God. Yes, that would be my position. He's not part God, part man, but fully God, fully man. Yeah, yeah. So we both acknowledge that there is a distinction between man and God there. It's just that, you know, all the verses, or I don't know if all the verses, but a lot of verses that are, tried, that are used to try and show a distinction between um, the first and second person of the Trinity can equally be explained by the distinction between the man Christ Jesus and God. You know, so when people say, well, hey, not my will, but thine be done in the garden. And they say, well, ah, there you go. That's a definite surefire way to prove that there's a distinction of will between the first and the second person of the Trinity. But the, the passage that you're referring to is a passage where the man is praying to God. 
and saying, not my will, but thine be done. So it can equally be explained by humanity and deity. And it's like in 1 Corinthians 15, when you talk about the chain of command, I do acknowledge that there is a chain of command within the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But I'm just saying that 1 Corinthians 15, the Orthodox Trinitarians seem to think that this is just a surefire verse that doesn't swing both ways. Whereas I think it it, it, it does. And, and I think it, it more swings in the way of humanity and deity because it's the man who died and rose again that is being spoken about in this. Now, I don't believe that just because it's speaking about the man that he's no longer God, because remember, the man was God manifest in the flesh. He wasn't He wasn't just a man. Okay, so this, I want to not forget, I'm going to, you know, you know, to respond here to some of that. So I'll try to, you know, try to, let's try to make a point and then, uh, you know, and respond. But basically, so I understand that you're saying it's just humanity is the distinction here, but I'm seeing this, you know, it is about the gospel. It's ultimately about putting to death, death. It's about conquering death and, and the work of the devil, you know, who corrupt man and, and the creation was given over to him you know, for temporarily. So what I see this as, it's that this is speaking of all things, not just the humanity and the moment of the cross, but it's speaking of, you know, everything. I mean, it's talking about that in, in, in throughout all eternity, from the beginning to the end, it's always been this hierarchy that exists between the Father and the Son. So would you say that the hierarchy does not exist in the eternal state before the incarnation of man? So what, God? Past, what what yeah. exact verse are you referring to in First Corinthians fifteen that says all things were put under him from eternity? Well, I'm I'm saying that's what the gospel is about. So I'm saying, do you disagree that this is speaking about all eternity here? That it, in the end, you know, that uh, when when Satan no, I, is conquered, I, I, is conquered I, and the world is given over to Jesus Christ and all authority in the millennial yep. reign is given to Christ. And Christ takes that authority and he subdues himself unto God the Father. So what passage are you what passage are you using to prove that this this all things were put under him happened in eternity past? Well, because it's all things. So by definition it's all things. It's eternity. Yeah, but, but we inherit all things too, but we didn't exist in eternity past. Okay, so are you saying that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit did not exist from all eternity past? Well, I, I personally am of the persuasion that the he existed as the Word. I don't believe he existed as the Son. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't believe the Son is eternal. I do believe the Son's eternal in the sense that he's the Word made flesh. But your, what my point is, is you're trying, you're, you, you're, you've turned to 1 Corinthians 15 to try and prove that there's a distinction, or you're trying to prove a point between the first and second person of the Godhead. But well, this passage is clearly about the man who died and rose again, and he's the first begotten from the dead. And it's this is the resurrection chapter, right? The fact that we are bodily going to rise from the dead too, um, right? And I don't and I don't deny that that the man will have all things put under his feet. But my question to you is: if you're using this passage to prove that this somehow proves something in eternity past, what what where are you reading that? Well, because by God's eternal nature, He's always existed as the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, you so, don't see that as a as your your view of the Trinity being read into that passage, as opposed to that's what this passage is actually saying. No, that, I really because ultimately, what I see it as is is the end culmination of the gospel, which is that you know when, like I was saying, when Christ has the millennial reign and He has all authority and power in in the universe. He gives that back to God the Father. It's not just the man Jesus. It's it's God Jesus. It's man Jesus. It's he's always been the Son. He's always you know. It's it's just he is eternal by nature. So that authority, Nate, that chain of command, and that hierarchy within the Godhead has always existed. But how are you using this passage to prove that? What what verse are you using to prove that? Well, simply the word "all" to begin with. In I verse mean, verse twenty-seven. For he hath put all things under his feet. All but is then, all. <laughs> but look, but verse 24 says, Then cometh the end. Oh, that's it. That's it. And it says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Now, is that not, is, is that not after the resurrection that's referred to in verses uh, 23? Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. 
then come at the end. So it's giving a timeline of things that are going to happen. And he says, for he must reign. Is that not a reference to the millennial reign of Christ? Till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. It's the millennial reign. It, yeah. You know, and every all, all authority and power will be given to Jesus, the 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 God man. He's it's not just his humanity, it's it's him. It's he is the God man. Yeah. So when he says and, he had put all things under him, right. That's referring to the a future event, right? The millennial reign. Yeah. But how are you using that passage to prove that all things were put under his feet from eternity past? Well, because if, if in eternity future, all things, if this, if this exists, this hierarchy exists, then from eternity past, it's existed also. He's always yeah. been the... I think, that's how, I think that's how oneness would debate that. They would say that that's in the fourth sight of God. They would say God already planned to do it. That's why Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But it's okay, something so that was to happen in the future. Some, let me put this in, in con- so we can get this in context. Are you saying there was no hierarchy structure in eternity past within the no, I, I do believe that the the word is subject to the father and that the holy spirit is subject to the word and i believe that they are three persons right because they're with each other and they're described as he and of himself and us and things like that um we're going on to a different topic now and i i believe it's just an issue of terminology in you know is is the son of god referring to the word manifest in the flesh or is the son, has, has the word existed as a son in, as in eternity well, past? I don't want to get too much into that debate because, like you said, it's a whole yeah, other It's, a, it's another topic. topic. I guess and, my- and, I, and I don't think, and, and like I said, again, I think it's a difference that is not a major difference because the way, I would ex- the way I would understand it is, you know, it's like I'm the same person, but there was a point in time where I was ordained and I became a bishop. So that bishop is eternal. That bishop is Victor in the sense that Victor became the bishop, but Victor didn't always exist as the bishop. But it's the same person. That's how I would okay. understand. But, well, but that's to, another topic. Just to, yeah. you a couple, just to ask you a couple succinct questions that might help clarify it is okay. Okay, so you're saying that there was a hierarchical st- structure within the Godhead from all eternity, just like a yes or no. Like you do believe there was. Yeah, yeah. I do believe the word is subject to the Father. Okay, so how? So if the word, ex- are you saying the three in one existed always from all eternity that way? Yeah. Okay, so why not five manifestations or seven or twelve? Why? Why three then? Because that's that's what God tells us He is. Okay. That so was you... basically that was basically the question I was uh, see the question you just asked is the question that I asked in my sermon, just saying you know. It, it's it's not that it's not that God decided what number He was going to be. He tells us whatever number He is, but I don't have I don't have a problem with whatever number that is because whatever He tells me He is, that's what He is. You know, His Word tells me that there are three that bear record in heaven, and these three are one. So that's why it's three. So when you say why isn't it five? Because the Scripture doesn't tell us it's five. The Scripture tells us it's three. Well, I believe a part of the reason. <laughs> Three is because of the father-son relationship. You know, there is a, a relationship within the Godhead that's always existed from all eternity. So, so why isn't it two? What's that? How come it's not two? Because you've got the Spirit as well, right? The Spirit, I believe, proceeds from that from the love of the Father and the Son. It's it's there. It's yeah. the spirit, you know. So that's why and then there's the Word, which is God's spoken word. So, but but because He's God, those you know, essences or part essences of them take on their own distinction and their own uh, will and Godhead so that the Son is fully God, the Spirit is fully God, you know, at the same time as the three being the one God. And so mm-hmm. I, I blend them in the sense that I, I, I can't, I mean, I get what you're saying that there could be paradoxes outside of our scope of, you know, creation because logic is in creation however the logos existed you know it was the word is logos which is logic so i just i see god himself is never paradoxical in his nature because it, he's the author of reason and logic and and engineering and math which you know also proves his intelligent design and all of these things so i just it's hard to wrap the mind around why would god be not paradoxical in any doctrine other than this one. 
Well, he is because he's man and God. That's a great mystery as well. I mean, he's infinite outside of his creation and somehow came into his creation as a limited man. So that's that to me, because Jesus didn't cease being God, right? It's not that he was. It's not that God became a man and ceased to be God. That man, Christ Jesus, was one hundred percent God. Now, if that's not a paradox, explain to me why that's not a paradox. Right, and I, and I think it. I think I get what you're saying. I don't think it's a complete paradox because things that we don't fully understand yet doesn't mean that they're not explainable. And I think the way that we understand. That Jesus is fully God and fully man is through the Scripture, like you said, which is that He's、mm-hmm. the second Adam. So He is the regenerated man, as you know, perfect being,、uh, yet begotten of the Holy Ghost. So in that sense, He's perfect man. Yeah, but and- I just think you're stating what He is. We know that He's 100% man and 100% God, but you're trying to make a case for why a paradoxical truth can't be so when that is. Well, no, I'm trying、yeah. to I'm trying to make a, a point that. We can reasonably and logically begin to explain how he's fully God and fully man at the same time, and a lot of that comes through him being the re, you know regenerated and perfect, perfected second Adam.、Um, and so there's so the point I'm making is that even in these doctrines that may appear paradoxical, they're not truly paradoxical. It's just that you really need to study them out and, and understand them. And I think the Trinity doctrine. Does explain God's nature without a paradox being necessary, which makes it a more reasonable argument to me. Yeah, so maybe that's where we have to continue because that's where I, I don't, I don't think so. But that's where we, we'd have to go a bit further into them. All right. The、so、second. Next. Well, maybe this one's a bit shorter. I'll just jump down to point three first before we get into maybe because Isaiah nine six is probably a bit more meaty. But、um, one thing you mentioned in your sermon is. Uh, you sort of made the point that, you know, God, God in Genesis one twenty six using us and our,、um, and also you know the word and between you know the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ is the death blow to the one person view. Now just remember, so I, I accept that there's three persons, right? I don't de- I don't deny that position, but I don't think that's a death blow to one person because if you're going to make the argument that a plural pronoun is the death blow to one person. Then surely the singular person pronoun is the death blow to the three person view, whereas I think both are true. That's why you have let us make man in our image, and then God made man in His own image directly after that, because you have the three persons and the one person alluded to, and also the the and separating you know the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ is not the death blow that they must be always separate persons, because you have and being used. I mean, if you just search God and Father. You know, in 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 some sort of software, I use Sword Searcher.、Um, you'll find multiple passages where God is separated from the Father with an and, but they're not two separate persons. So I just think that maybe you can you can respond to that argument. So there's two two things I brought up is the plural pronoun proving that it must only be three persons when they're singular pronouns, and the and being used to separate Jesus and the Father when and is also used to separate God and the Father. So you wouldn't say that God is not the Father just because they're separated verse, by an end. Which verse particularly are you saying where where it says the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. So I mean, let me give an example. First、uh, Thessalonians three、uh, eleven, it says, "Now God Himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ." So you wouldn't there say, "Well, and is the death blow to."、Um, You know, if somebody made the argument, well, and between God Himself and our Father is the death blow to people thinking that the Father is God, you would make that argument. You just recognize it's just two things of the same person. So, just because there's an and between God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't necessarily pr- discount the one person aspect. I think it, I think you'd have to look at the context of that. I mean, in that passage when it says, "Now God Himself." And then he's saying, "Well, God Himself is our Father." You know, it's it's now God Himself and our Father, and, and Lord、yep. Jesus Christ. Kind of like when I prayed, you know, tonight beforehand, when before we went on, it was you know, I'm like, "Dear God, Lord Jesus," you know, "Dear Father," I come to you in Jesus. Then you start kind of blending in your prayers. It's kind of like that. I think that's written. It's yeah, saying, but, but look you know, at the、God. look at how it refers to 
Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same words, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're saying, and our just means it's also him, then it's the exact same words before and our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's just a part of the literary style of that passage. You know, I, I think oh. it's just saying, you know, there's different ways to look at it. Um, oh, when, I agree was, with you. There are different ways to look at it. What was your second question? Uh, the second point was if in Genesis one twenty six, where he says, let us make man in our image, and you're saying that's the death blow to one person because it uses a plural person pronoun. Surely when God says, I, me, he, you know, everywhere else, that would be the death blow to three persons with your, I with your reasoning. I, I think both are true. But if your reasoning is us I, is death blow to one person, then I is death blow to three persons. I, I mean, I kind of get what you're saying. I think, um, you know, the way I understand those is when it says, let us make man, it's just speaking of God's plurality, that he is that He is triune, and he is, you know, that the triunity equals the the one God, you know, but not, not one again, not qualitatively or quantitatively or qualitatively, you know, where it's just, mm -hmm. it's really a declaration of the triune nature of God, the fact that God speaks as one and he speaks as, as three. You know, yeah, but, but think it, about it. You use a plural personal, plural personal pronoun to prove the three persons, and that one God being is saying I. So how do you get away from the fact that that one being God, who you, who you would say is just in quali qualitatively, not quantitatively, is ascribing a quantitative pronoun and saying I? Well, it says, let us make man in our image. So those are both plural. Yeah. No, but the next verse would say, then God made man in his own image. Yeah, just showing the one the one nature, you know, that God is one. With a singular personal pronoun. Right. I think that that verse can support both positions because we're just seeing it as, you know, it's the one God who exists in three persons in the us, and you're seeing it as the three equals one. I think... Yes. I think so you can see verse, it's not a not a death blow, it's just... I would say it's a it death blow to the oneness heretics like Tyler Baker and, and people like that because they think God is only one. Yeah, and you you're know? right, and that's where I would disagree with them. I, I disagree that saying that there are three persons is not false. Where I disagree is, where, see, where I disagree with them is that God is three persons. Where I disagree with you is I do think God is one person. So I think you're separating God too much, and I think they're bringing him together too much. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's sort of a debate, you know, yeah, but yeah. I, so, when you say that the one, the conjunction and, you know, like even in John 1, one and others, when I said it's a death blow to oneness, I believe it is. I mean, it is. I'm not saying I, my concern with you is that pretty much every verse I bring, you can say, well, both are true, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a paradox. So that kind of, you know, because I'll even look at things like, you know, another major, major point for me is the uh, witnesses, that there had to be two or three witnesses, you know, two or more witnesses for Jesus's claim to be the Messiah to be true, because according to the law, it couldn't be one person, it had to be three. Now that kills oneness heresy, that it's done. No, but, no, it doesn't, because they acknowledge you know, they acknowledge the distinction between the man and God. So it doesn't destroy their position because, and that's why you have to realize that. A man isn't qualified I know there is witness. If, it, if it's just a man, the man isn't qualified. See, I think it does destroy oneness. I'm not saying, now your view, you can say it's both, I guess, you know, but, but with the oneness. Well, I wouldn't I would, interpret that passage based on the two persons within the Trinity. I would interpret that passage based on the man testifying and the Father in heaven testifying. But the, but the oneness has no other choice, right? But to say, because they believe mm -hmm. it's just one person. So if there's, if they don't even believe there's three. At least you're saying there's three. And I can, I, you know, I would say I'm closer to your view than theirs. Yeah, Even I though I'm really, ortho, you know, I'm more orthodox. I'm, or, you know, the orthodox. Well, I, I, I don't agree that, that it needs the other option because I think that verse is adequately explained that there's a man and there's God, and there's the two persons. Uh, because think about, think it's like well, here, in the garden with in Gethsemane, right? It's it's all the a lot of the passages that you're referring to to try and prove first and second person it is is it are passages that involve the man, like the man is involved. It, the man is saying that passage. Because you know? this is a really important point. Because okay. if when it comes to the witnesses, 
if Jesus, um, if it was just a man testifying, okay, then it, it, he couldn't because it has to, only God is qualified to testify about God. And then the third witness was was the Holy Spirit. So his humanity uh, wouldn't, you know, you need you need deity there to be able to testify. So the distinction, I believe, he says plainly, he mm. says that it's the Father that giveth testimony unto me. You know, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So he's saying, I'm one witness as fully God and fully man. Remember, Jesus wasn't, you can't separate his humanity from his deity. Yeah, yeah, Even I agree with you. You know, I mean, so I, it, I should nod, actually. I went like this. I should nod. I agree with you. Okay, so we agree that it's not just the, it's the, it's, it has to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost that are witnessing for it to be a valid testimony. No, no. And, I don't think that's what this is referring to. Now, I do believe there are three that bear record in heaven, but I'm saying the passage that you're trying to use to prove it in John 8, that he's saying the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness, and my Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Now, where you've just inserted in there, you just assume that the Holy Spirit's testifying too. But I, he, didn't talk, he didn't talk about the Holy Spirit here. He just said, I'm one that witnesses, and my Father, and he says the testimony of two men are true. So who are the two men there? You could easily... I mean, the oneness people could easily yeah. say, hey, that's the man, Christ Jesus, is one man, and God the Father is the second person. There's a misunderstanding here, Victor, because okay. I, was reading from, I was reading from John 5. Oh, you're, John you're, 5? Okay. Because in John 5, see, in John 8, and let me explain John 8, because what he's saying is that the testimony of two men, he's saying in your law it's written that the testimony of two men is true, but who are men testifying about in the law? They're testifying about other men. But when it comes to the testimony that he's the Messiah, it has to be the, the Godhead that testifies. That's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that testifies that he's God. In John 5, if you go to verses 31, 32, 36, and 37, I'll just read it real quick. It says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true speaking of God the Father, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Now, Jesus, we have Jesus there, the Son, fully God, fully man. We also have the Father there testifying. And by implication of the works that he did through the Holy Ghost, we have the third witness, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me, it's and it goes on, you know, that's through, through implication. So it's not, well, it's not it's the passage there. actually it's, says that you just the, the, through implication is when we read something into it, right? Victor, we're, the point isn't to like win this argument or you know, debate. The point is the truth, right? So, what this is really saying is that the works which I do bear witness of me. Well, mm -hmm. how, do, how does Jesus do those works by the Holy Spirit? It's just, I mean, you can put up a hundred other verses that show that the works that Jesus does are born of the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit through me, which bear witness along with the Son, along with the Father. And so there's a distinction at work. It's not his humanity only. You can't separate his humanity from his deity. He is fully God, fully man at the same time, testifying as God-man. God and man, you know. But, That's how I understand that passage. Yeah, yeah. It's a very important passage. It, the witnesses. But what you know, about? Have, yeah, yeah. But what about John fourteen ten? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, He doeth the works. Amen. I mean, see, the way I understand that passage is that the distinction never blend, but. They live inside of one another. It's kind of like a proton or something, you know, where it has a neutron. Or, you know, it's like the three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but what That's I'm saying is in regards to John 5, is you're saying by implication, the one doing the works through Jesus is the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says yeah. the Father's the one doing the works through me. Well, the Father commissions the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And so through the Holy Spirit, God sends the Holy Spirit to do the works through Jesus. So the, the three are there. 
you know, so all three testify. And the only way Jesus could be, could be the Christ is if the three are testifying of of his messiahship, you know. Well, I, 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 don't, disagree, I don't disagree with you there. I, I agree that all three testify that Jesus is the Son of God. But I'm just saying in that very passage that you're trying to use to show that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, three persons within the Trinity that are testifying in that passage, that's where I think you're going outside of what that passage is actually talking yeah. about, that there's a man, there's God we the Father, and he's saying the works bear witness of me because the works are the Father doing the works through him. Yeah, I mean, we can move on from that, but I'll okay. just say I think it's pretty clear from my understanding of it, and I think a lot of the Trinitarians would probably agree, is that, you know, the works are always done by the work of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit wasn't there, the works wouldn't have been done. So just logically piecing those, you know, synchronizing the scriptures and doing the word studies here, we see that it's the Holy Spirit. But we can move on and, you know, yeah. unless you have anything else on that. But um I, I think, think it's that's probably, a, I think it's your turn to ask one of yours. Sorry? I think okay, it's your, one, your turn to ask. Um, all right, so let me see what else I have. I mean, Isaiah 9, 6, I think you brought up, was, was an important one. I think just to kind of refute the other side of it. Okay. Is that, is that um, I mean, this is sort of the point that you guys bring up to say he is the father, right? But the, the thing with Isaiah 9, 6, let me just turn to it. And for those, you know, who might not even be familiar with it, I think people that are attuned to this particular um, debate or discussion are attuned to it. But I had it somewhere here. But anyway, I'll pull it up online. Isaiah 9, 6. So Isaiah 9, 6 is the passage that uh, it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And now, granted, I think this is the strongest passage that the oneness modalist and the Victor Tay view has. You know, I don't know which one to call yours exactly, but uh, although I think it kind of has some I like to call it the biblical view. <laughs> okay, but... I mean, you know, but we can debate that. But uh, for unto us a child is born, you know. So I think this is the strongest one that you guys have, but it can be explained in several ways. For one thing, it's saying unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So it's really about the son here, for, you know, first and, and foremost. It's a prophecy that's being spoken. We know we prophesy through a glass darkly. Uh, these are things that were shrouded in mystery at the time to some degree. They weren't fully revealed yet until the New Testament. So one of the basic principles of biblical exegesis is that we interpret the Old Testament by the lens of the New. You know, So when I have any major, major doctrine, I better be able to show it in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, we have you know, never, ever, ever see Jesus referred to as the Father, you know, it just never happens. So in this passage to say, well, this proves that he's the father is kind of, it kind of falls apart because it's also talking about, you know, first of all, it's not saying the father or God, the father, it's saying the everlasting father. Now, you know, the way that we understand it as Trinitarians is that, um, you know, this is first of all, Jesus is the father of all creation along with the mighty, you know, God and the counselor, you know, which is the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit, they're all present too in this passage. Uh, it's speaking of the triunity of God. So he's the father of creation. He's the father of believers to some sense, the way that, uh, you know, we've been begotten by the word, we're begotten of Jesus. So, you know, we have that in that way, he's our father. Uh, so there's many ways that we can see him as an everlasting father. But here's the main thing that I believe here is that this, again, being a prophecy, it's just simply speaking about the attributes of God. It's saying, you know, he shall be called the mighty God. He shall be called the everlasting father. So these are the attributes of the nature of God, which are contained in him because he's the express image of the Godhead. So in that sense, he's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. It's his <clears throat> attitude in a prophecy, you know, foretelling his, his deity, basically. So that's how I understand that passage. All right. How so I can respond. 
Now, first of all, when it comes to attributes, uh, so I'll, I'll probably address them in reverse order if I remember them all. First of all, with attributes, it wouldn't make sense if Jesus is given attributes that don't actually apply to him. You know, he's called Emmanuel because he is God with us. He's called Wonderful because he is. He's called Counselor because he is. He's called the Mighty God because he is. And he's called the Everlasting Father because he is. So I don't think you would make the argument that he's just given attributes, but he's not these attributes. Well, would you like, like, he, he, like he's given these attributes because these are things that he, he is. Not because he's just being called it and he isn't. Well, it says he shall be called, right? By who? By people. And we do say Jesus is God, right? So what it's basically say, I, I get your point though, it, but it, you know, and he is all those things, but he is not necessarily, it doesn't mean that he's God, the father in those, in that exact, you know, terminology. He's not God. Yeah. yeah. Well, I haven't addressed that, addressed that yet. But, right. but you would you would agree that these attributes that are given to him well, because I would these, say, I would say these that, yeah. he is these things. It's just the question you have to uh, you or you're trying to answer is in what way is he a father? Yeah, I would just because, say it's really saying he's God. Basically, it's saying he is God. He's the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings. It's a very general and broad. Well, way. the Mighty God is is what's calling him God, but the everlasting Father is calling him the Father. But the question is. How do you understand what that father is? And everyone has different explanations of this passage. You've already, you've provided two already. You said he's either the, the father of creation or he's um, the, the fa our spiritual father. So which one do you ascribe to? Do you think I he's... Think, the I think it's both. I mean, kind of like Father Abraham, you know, we are begotten by the word. We're, we're born again, in, you know, through Christ. So we're... He's our father. He's our spiritual father. He, but he also was present during the creation. He's also displaying his attribute of being deity, of being God. So he's the everlasting father in that sense. But it's still not the, the this very specific title that we give only to the father, which is God the Father. So I can never say the Son is the Father. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can say the Son is God. I can say the Father is God. I can say the Holy Spirit is God. And all three, you know, are Jehovah or God, but I can't say that, you know, Jehovah is only Jesus or Jehovah is only the Father or Je Jehovah is only the Spirit. You know, it doesn't work that way. It's that the three distinct persons together comprise the one God and they all live and move and have their being inside of one another. So that's how I understand the Trinity. I mean, how they can be three co equal, co substantial persons living together as close as they can be inside of one another without actually being each other. And that's where we get other passages like I started with, where it talks about may, you know, speaking of the church, may they be one as we are one, you know, we're not going to lose their individuality and I'm never going to become literally one with any other human being or brother in Christ. It's never, that's never going to happen. So that is defining what Jesus meant when he said these three are one is that it's speaking of one unity, one nature, one, you know, that we may all be one in, in our purpose and in our lives, et cetera. You know, that's how I understand those. You know, I think it, it's pretty clear biblically. Philosophically, it's interesting what you're saying. But biblically, I don't know if there's, there's I think there's much more support for the Trinitarian view biblically than there is for what you're saying, although you make some good, some interesting points. Yeah. So you believe, so you do believe it's referring, it's, it's not a reference to God, the father, the everlasting father. You just think it's a reference to him be the, either being the creator or being uh, our spiritual father. Is that the That's position you're two taking? Of, two of the three things I said, I mean, it's, it's sort of like you were, it's not one simple answer. It's, it's those two things along with the fact that Jesus is God and, it, and he, he takes on the full nature of God, you know, as the son. So in every way, Jesus is God. So when it's saying people are going to call him this, the everlasting father, well, we do. We call him God. All the, you know, Jesus is God. That's how I got saved, you know. So, but it mm -hmm. doesn't negate the fact that he's three, you know, uh, distinct persons who together comprise the one God. Not that yeah. the one in three, equal, you know, it's... It's, I don't, I don't yeah. think well, it's as heretical as Tyler Baker or Garrett Kirchway or others. Uh, but I think there are definitely some clear differences in, in our understanding of, of the Godhead.
Yeah, well, I don't consider what they believe complete heresy, but I'm not here to defend them. I'm sure they can defend themselves. But um, in terms of this passage, I let me just address the different issues you brought up. So one is, I don't think these are just attributes that don't apply to him. I think these are, and I think you would agree, these are attributes that do apply to him. I do think that there is a case in the New Testament for Jesus being the Father. It's just that you would explain them a different way. You know, we I'm, talked about, you know, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I do believe First John 3 teaches that the Father was manifest in the flesh as well as the Son was manifest in the flesh. So, and I think there's definitely an overlap. You know, the way we would prove that Jesus is Jehovah is we see two things happen to the same person. Uh, but yet when we see, like, for example, Romans 8, when it's the spirit that dwells in you, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, or we see the, the, the people speaking in the end times saying, hey, I'll give you the words to speak. The Holy Ghost is going to speak through you. My Father is going to speak through you. We would see that as evidence in the New Testament that these persons are overlapping because they're fulfilling each other's roles and all that sort of thing. So I do think there is a case for Jesus being the Father in the New Testament as well as the Son. Um, let me let me respond to yeah, that. You wanna, go ahead. Because, uh, you know, those overlaps we see, I think, define the, the triune nature of God. That's how we understand it. But what I would say is this, because if, if there was a, a very clear passage, let's say in the epistles of Paul, because Paul's epistles are a commentary on the Gospels. You know, he's basically describing what Jesus taught. And, and there's not one time, if there was one time where Paul said, you know, our Lord, our uh, God, uh, Jesus, the Father or something, or, you know, where it directly says the Son is the Father or Jesus the Father. I just go to the plain, simple, fundamental reading of God's word because otherwise my ideas and philosophy could get me off track. So for me, it's like the plain passage says there's like, you know, hundreds of passages that call Jesus the Son of God. Never. Well, I don't need I don't need a clear passage from Paul because Jesus said it himself when Thomas you know, was it uh But they but they have, Philip, Philip said to him, you know, like show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And he said, Have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And I know we have a different interpretation of what it means for Jesus to be when he says, I and my father are one. But I think we've already discussed that. We probably don't need to revisit it, that I think it's more than just one in unity. So I, I think, I, I, and, I, and I agree with you that the emphasis in the New Testament is in the distinction between the father and the son. But that doesn't mean the, 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 the contrary is not true as well, because I think there is evidence that, that both truths are there. The last thing I just wanted to say about Isaiah 9 6 is it's 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 a it's an obvious passage that is addressing just this in your view the second person of the Trinity, right? Because this is saying unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So how how what what I find Orthodox Trinitarians are doing is they're making this passage to just apply to God in general, because they acknowledge that it says the mighty God, the everlasting father just emphasizing the word the, the prince of peace. So they can't just say the second person is the only one that's the mighty God. But then they just then they just make a general sweeping statement saying, well, it's because all these attributes apply to everybody. Well, because that's three weak. persons within the Trinity. But this this passage is specifically addressing the second person in the Trinity, according to your view, and saying that that second person is the mighty God, the everlasting father. Now, if you then say these persons are distinct, but the Holy Spirit's also the everlasting Father and God the Father is also the everlasting Father, then you've got three that are the everlasting Father. But this passage says that the, the, the Son is the everlasting Father. He's not just an, another everlasting Father. It doesn't literally you know? say, just two, two comments on that. It doesn't literally say that he's the everlasting Father. It says that he shall be called. Again, speaking of his... Mm -hmm his nature and his attributes but also you're yeah, right i agree with you he's called that because he is you know that's what i mean it's not just that he's given a name that means nothing right like he, he, his name shall be called the mighty god because he is the mighty god and his name shall be called the everlasting father because he is the everlasting father because when you start saying well he's just called something but he isn't that then is he called the mighty God, but he's not the mighty God? Well, this gets to the second point that you made, which which is that it, it is more of a sweeping statement because what we believe in this plain and simple reading is that this is simply a prophecy saying that Jesus is God, you know? And so that's really the main intent of Isaiah 9, 6. 
I don't think it's meant to, uh, you know, call him God the Father because you see evidence of that in that the Son is there, the Holy Spirit is there as the counselor, and then you've got the everlasting Father. It's just saying that the whole triune Godhead is there present in Jesus. We get that Jesus is the express image of God. You know, we line Isaiah 9, 6 with that passage. And I think if, if you know, I think that makes a case for the Trinity also. But I, I, I do acknowledge, you know, like I think you guys have this. The strongest verse you have is Isaiah 9, 6 because of that. But when you dig in a little bit deeper and start to synchronize other passages that speak of his triunity, then you see that it's really just a prophecy saying that the Godhead, the Son within the Godhead, because the Son shall be given not a father, but a son shall be given, is, is there present in the person of Jesus Christ. And so very simply, it's just saying, Isaiah is saying, I'm prophesying of the manifestation, of, or uh, not manifestation, I meant incarnation. I'm prophesying about the incarnation of God in the person mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. To read beyond that, I think, isn't really the point to take that and say, well, he's God the Father, based on that one phraseology that is really speaking of so much else. So that's why I refer back to the New Testament and I say, look, if, if there is a verse in the New Testament that says, you know, we have like a hundred that say the Son, the Son, the Son, the Son, the Son, Jesus the Son, the Son died for you, you know, et cetera. We have a hundred passages that always distinctly talk about God the Father, God the Father, then the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, and they're always so distinct, uh, not just in their humanity, but in their eternity, in their in their persons, that I go with those clear New Testament passages that, you know, that interpret Isaiah, you know, for us. And so that's why, you know, I think there's some some points that you can make for it, but I don't see that I think I think there's a lot more evidence for the, the orthodox trinitarian view when you're looking in light of the new testament i think that's what it comes down to simply speaking i didn't have a lot more in terms of tonight's discussion i think we we covered a lot is there any final question that you have or verses you want to bring out or any questions for me or you well, know i'll just uh, i'll just make a comment on just what you're saying there but um i don't i don't think we i don't think either of us reject the New Testament verses, right? So when you say you're synchronizing it with the Orthodox Trinity, we're all synchronizing it. We're all trying to harmonize the scriptures. It's just you're trying to harmonize it with an understanding of the Orthodox Trinity, which obviously we, we've only just scratched the surface today. And I'm harmonizing it with a view that shows, hey, God is three persons, but he's one person also. And, and this is where I feel that your view hasn't been synchronized to this because, you know, even you're, you're, you're trying to explain it by just saying, oh, you know, Isaiah doesn't actually mean what, what we just plainly read it as. It's just a general statement of a Messiah coming and he's God. But that's not what, that's not what this passage says. And this is why I think it's difficult for the Orthodox Trinitarians to explain away this verse because they, they're finding it hard to fit their ideology of this Orthodox Trinity to this passage because it's very clear that this child, this son that is born, which they think is the second person of the Trinity, is it's not just saying he's just God, because that's what the mighty God is referring to. But a second attribute there is called the everlasting father. Now, if they start just saying this is only the second person of the Trinity, how is the second person of the Trinity uniquely the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, when they have three persons that are never each other, and those other persons do things too, like the like the father, he also is the creator. So I don't believe in two creators. I believe in one creator. Um, and also you said as well that the counselor refers to the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't think that's necessarily false, but I just don't know where in scripture that the count the the name counselor is ever applied in I the King James Bible to it's just self-evident because he's he guides and teaches us, he's our teacher. So he's our counselor, but, yeah. uh, but that's but, that's you reading that's that's you reading it into the passage. That's not like that's I think it's a reasonable exit. You know, there's no scripture that says the, that the counselor is the Holy Spirit. The only scripture we have is the Son is the is called counselor, right? But I so think that's just trying to you trying to fit Isaiah nine six to your philosophy, which is hey these attributes just apply to all three of them, whereas that's this passage is referring specifically to the Son. 
we can agree to disagree on that. I mean, I don't think I'm reading. I think it's a reasonable, uh, you know, exegesis of that passage to say that the counselor is the Holy Spirit. I know he's my counselor. He's my teacher. So I think it's pretty self-evident. But but that's a technical point. I think the, you know, uh, the important thing is you got to get some of your views out. Um, I understand the logic behind what you're saying. I don't think it's it's swayed me from the Orthodox Trinity. I think one of the interesting points you made that gives me something to think about is how God can be paradoxical and not at the same time if we're talking outside the bounds of the physical created universe. But I would say that I think that was one of the, the more interesting points for me personally, you may. I think it still goes to the nature of God just to answer that it still goes back to the nature of God and, and God being logical himself in his nature, which is, that's why we have logic and we have the logos, the word, you know, I think it speaks of the fact that his logic doesn't, isn't limited to the physical creation. And, you know, it also must therefore apply to his own nature as well. So that's why I can't see him as being paradoxical uh, in his nature, in that sense, I think there's always an explanation. I think the Trinity is the best explanation of that that we have, and that's why it shouldn't be discarded. That's why it's been it's been you know for two thousand or eight seventeen eighteen hundred years that we know of you know on record. It, it potentially you know we uh, I would believe it's always you know, like I said I don't I don't I don't determine doctrine by the majority. Yeah. I don't, and I don't think the Orthodox Trinity is the best explanation for all these scriptures because I think you've you've tried to explain scriptures and made it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's the best. Can I ask you this question? When yeah. when you say God is uh, like because because you would say as the, an Orthodox Trinitarian, three persons, one substance. Would you use the word substance or being? Being substance, is usually the word. Uh, substance and essence. I mean, he's made of the same material, whatever he is. It's, an, it's not a material, that's, but he's immaterial as yeah. the, the spirit, but it's the same essence, you would say, I think. Would so, be, yeah, uh, so this, so, the, so you, because obviously you don't worship just one of the persons. So when you worship God, you're worshiping this, this essence or substance or being, right? Correct. Well, I'm worshiping the entirety of the Godhead through mm -hmm. this, the Son, because that's my mediator. <laughs> Because I can't go directly to the Father, I go through the mediation of of the Son. Okay, so so how would you explain what what is this what is this substance or being? Because I, if you're not like, if you're not worshiping just one of the three, like what 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 is this being that we worship that is called God in the Orthodox Trinitarian mind? Well, he's everything. You know, he's the. Um, the creator. I mean, all the traditional things that we say of him. I'm not sure if I fully understand the uh, the angle of, of your question, like what you're trying to get to. Is, I well, because everybody understands what a person is, right? They, they think it's an individual. So we understand that there are three persons. And I would see God as an individual. That's why I see three persons that are at the same time one person. I, I worship an individual God, right? Um, that is also all three of those persons. Whereas you say God is not a person, you you don't say he's an individual. You say he's a substance or an essence or a yeah, being. So is, what is that substance yeah. or being? That like how how what's an analogy or an explanation you can give for somebody to understand? Hey, this is what that being is. Give me one sec because and I'm, and I want to answer that question. It's a good question. Uh, I have to plug in my wire for my my charger for my laptop. Or sure, sure. So give because I think this is where we disagree. This, where we disagree is is in how uh, how God is one. I think we probably are very similar in how God is three, but we differ in how God is one. <clears throat> I am almost there. I just I have three percent battery life on here, so I got to plug in and. There up oh, came out again. Give me one. Yeah, second. this will probably be the last point, and then we'll both have to go. I'm more than happy to do another one if people are interested in to hear a further. I think we've just scratched the surface on one conversation. I'm sure it'll take maybe two or three, and I'm, I'd be more happy to more than happy to schedule some more, and we can discuss this further. All right. Because I, I would like to see your explanation of other passages that I brought up. I'm, I know I'm plugged in. You listen to. If you listen to the Trinity Confusion Sermon, there are other uh, there are some where I've heard explanations that I think are reasonable since then, um, but I think there are still some that need an explanation. 
But go ahead, you can answer what, yeah, I'm, how do you I'm, understand what this substance is? Because I've understood it as people saying it's like people are part of the one church. So church is like this substance or they say like, you know, you're a human being and I'm a human being. And that's like how God is God. He's, he's God being not human being. So how would you explain it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that we're worshiping some substance or essence, you know, I mean, we, we worship God. You know the word the the father the son the holy ghost i mean i'm not sure exactly in when, what context you're you're asking that question i, I just I, I that's why I, I don't i don't even know how to explain. see i understand the being of god as one person so I, when people would ask me well what 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 is god i'd say well he's an individual that we that we worship and if they say well who's the father the word on the holy ghost it's like well they're all that same mm -hmm. one person it's just you know god sure. is able to God is able to be three in the sense yeah. that he, he's that. bound by yes. our limitations. But I can explain to them that we worship one individual God who made all things. They're not just, we're not worshiping just a shared attribute. Right. But so, how, how, would, how would you understand what the, this being is? Yeah. So he's a being. I think that would be the best modern vernacular, you know, to describe God is he's a being. He's a personal being. He exists. That's, I am. That's, that's how we would understand a person, though. So, how is you're saying he's not a person? So, then what is this being if it's not a person? Well, he's a being that exists in three different entities, so to speak. You know, we don't quite have perfect language to describe it. That's why the Bible just says three, but we see a distinction in his in his being, and that distinction is that he's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so, those, how would that? Sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm cutting you off. I apologize. So how would that how would that contradict my view? Because that's how I see it. I see it that there's three that are distinct, and you say yourself, well, we don't have the perfect words to describe the being. And I'm saying, well, I think the word is person. I think he's well, one person because the Bible shows that. that there's yeah. one God, and that God is I. So I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> let, me, let me answer it before I, you know, because you ask a question, I don't want to, and then uh, you start getting me thinking about a million other things while you ask Sorry. a question. So, That's why I'm more than happy to have another conversation because I know a lot of things get raised and they don't get tied off. So your question was, what's the difference? I would say that, uh, you know, I could never get myself to say that Jesus is the Father or that mm -hmm. this, you know, or that the Father is the Son. Would, would you be comfortable using that terminology? Yeah, because I, I believe on the same side, on the same, uh, how do I say, at the same time, there's one person that is all three of them. So there are three persons, but at the same time, there's one person that's all three of them. Right. So like, I see it as... Think about it this way. Like when you read a passage like Isaiah 43, this is probably one that's been talked about a lot. In Isaiah 43, where he says, you know, before me, there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord. Beside me, there is no savior. Like when you read that passage, who's speaking here? Is it, is it the... Is it the being of God speaking? Which passage was that? I would say the Godhead without, if I just, if I heard the right one, which one? Yeah, which Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. All right, let me pull it up because uh, 43, 10 and 11. Uh, so this says, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before mm -hmm. me there is no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I even I am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. So I would say this is the word. Because, you know, the written word is, is the, you know, is Jesus. The word was made flesh. So that would equal the son. So it's really the son speaking, but he's speaking of, you know, the, he's of the whole Godhead. He's speaking of, he's speaking on behalf because he's that mediation. He's that word between us and the Godhead. And so it's really a revelation of God's word, which is the son. And that's just. So you, think, you think only the son is speaking there? I would say the son is 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 speaking on behalf of the father and the spirit. The spirit is writing this word through the apostles, or in this case through the prophet Isaiah. So that's the Holy Spirit present in this word. And then mm -hmm. the you know the the word itself, which is the eternal son, is speaking is the actual word, and it's all speaking of on behalf of God the Father, who they represent in their being. Because the mediation of Christ has always been there from, from the start. Oh, wait a second. Are you saying the Son is speaking here on behalf of the Godhead? When he says something like, before me, that me, is he referring to himself or to the Godhead? 
he is speaking he is speaking on behalf of the godhead so he can so you're saying that the son can say me even though he's speaking on behalf of three people yes because he's he's god and he's he's the representative he's the mediation the son is the mediation between us and god the fa- and god the father and the god the whole entirety of the godhead really you know it's kind of this gets into some philosophical realms of of understanding <laughs> nature and it's it's complex I, to understand but uh i believe you know i mean this is the word of god we know that the written word of god is the word is jesus right i mean we all agree that the when you look at the words of the bible wouldn't you say that's the word of god and that's jesus oh, absolutely I, I think but i think this is simple to understand that there's one person here saying there's no other god before him i think it starts to get complicated when you start trying to cram oh, I, I won't use that that i i, I guess i'm I shouldn't say it that way, but you know, you're trying to fit the orthodox view into here where they're never one person. And now you're saying there's this one person speaking on behalf of three people. And even though he's speaking on behalf of three people, he's using the singular personal pronoun. And I think there's a problem there if only one person of the Godhead is speaking because he's saying that there's no other God beside him. So it's hard. That's the, first, that's the first time I've heard somebody say that it's like, you know, he's speaking on behalf of three people and he, he's able to use I, even though he's speaking for all three of them. Well, he's in the Father. He is God. He's the image of God. I mean, he's the express image of God. He's the mediation between man and God. And so that word is a, is mediating right now between God and man. And so, of course, yeah. that has to be Jesus speaking on behalf of the Godhead. That's a Trinitarian yeah. position again. I mean, I don't know if a lot of Trinitarians understand this, you know, but I think it is it is uh, well explained by by the Trinity doctrine. Again, it's like it's one of those. Yeah, I think that's why I asked you what what is God when you say Jesus is mediating between him and God. It's not. Oh, he's obviously not mediating between him and his substance. He's mediating between him and a person, God, right? Which we would understand. If is it First Corinthians six eight? Unto, unto us there is but one God, the Father. Yeah, it's just well, no, not not the Father, the Godhead, because you have Deuteronomy six four: Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Even within that, you have, hear, O Israel, the Lord, that's one, our God, that's two, is one Lord, that's three, that there's a triune nature within Deuteronomy 6, 4 expressed right there in, in the Shema, you know, and then so you get, um, yeah, you get Deuteronomy 6, 4, and then even Elohim, if you hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord, which is Jehovah, our God, Elohim, is one Jehovah. So it's saying, our God, Jehovah, the personal name of God is plur- is a plurality, is Elohim, you know, is Jehovah. So it, there's a triunity even there. Uh, so I just see the Godhead, when you say, who am I worshiping? I see the Godhead as a triune being. He's one God who is triune in his nature, existing eternally as the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in their distinction. You know, but together they are living and moving inside of one another as the one God. You know. Yeah, and I think my view is similar. It's just I think where we disagree is how God is one. I think we agree that He's three persons. Right. You would say that they're one, just like you said, quant uh, qualitatively. Qualitatively speaking of the qualities of His nature. Yeah, and that's where I think it. it it's. I feel that it, it's hard to fit that view to passages where that one qualitative God is referred to quantitatively, like in Isaiah 43. But the, the passage I'm trying to find, uh, I know it's in Corinthians, it gets quoted also. Ah, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, right? But to us, there is but one God, and that's being contrasted to the multiplicity of false gods, right? Which is the one God that we worship. And it says, there is but one God, the Father. So God is the Father, but somehow, you know, we make that one God not the Father by saying, you know, well, Jesus is mediating between God. But what, what passage is yeah. that? Pull that up so I get a view. Uh, First Corinthians eight six. But unto to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. 
So there's one God who's the Father, and there's one Lord who's Jesus Christ. So I think that's that's referring to, I think passages like this refer to the distinction between the man, Christ, Jesus, and God. But I don't think that means that God is, Jesus is not God, you know, because Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. It's just that I don't see, I don't see God, I don't see the, the term God as just a substance or essence that is shared between the three. I see it as an individual, you know, beside me, you know, there's no God formed. I, even I, you know, God beside me, there is no savior. That's who's talking. When we talk about what you would define as this qualitative essence right. or substance. So why don't we end with this? Cause there's a lot, you know, yep. that we've covered. Uh, but would you, would you then say, if you could just give me an explanation of this and perhaps, you know, we'll close with this is when it says that, that, you know, the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, would mm -hmm. you then see that in, in the humanity is God, the father, the, the God of Jesus. How do you understand those passages? Cause we see it within yeah. the hierarchy, you know, where it's that the son is submitted to the father. And that's why he can be called the God and Father of our of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I would see those passages more in light of humanity and deity. I would see passages like in, you know, John fourteen or John seventeen, where he's saying, "I was with you." You know, John one one, the Word was with God. That's where I would see the two persons within the Godhead. Okay. All right. Well, so it's like when Jesus says, "You know, we will come and make our abode with Him." passages like that would show that 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 can't be the man right because the man doesn't live inside me right so why don't we um kind of just give our closing closing statements so to speak you know if you want to take like three minutes uh and then i'll take three minutes and and uh, or so and then we'll we'll close with that because uh we have covered a lot um so do you have any any closing thoughts Oh, a closing statement. Oh, I didn't prepare a closing no, statement. I, mean, I don't have a formal but one. I, I would say uh, if somebody has listened all the way to the end here, I, I, I think they can see. I don't think we disagree how they are three. I think we may disagree on the terminology of the sun and whether the sun refers to uh, the man or whether it refers to he was the sun in eternity past. To me, that's a, a, an issue of terminology and, and at what point's the right time to refer to him. But in terms of how we agree that there are three eternally existing persons within the Godhead, Father, Word, and Holy Ghost, I think we would agree there. Where we disagree is how they are one. And, and you would say, well, they're just one quant qualitatively saying hey there's just three persons in unity and you just don't understand how they come together and i would say well i agree with you too like i don't fully understand how they come together but what i see in scripture is an overlap i see that jesus is one with the father in a greater way than we are one with each other and i also see um uh that god refers to himself in the singular personal pronoun thousands of times throughout the bible we believe that there's one god so and i and i don't think there's any issue with god's nature being paradoxical in sense that he can be both one personal god and at the same time the three persons that we see revealed to us throughout the scripture so yes the word was manifest in the flesh but the word was with god and the word and the word was god so i hope you get a, a bit of a better understanding of where i'm coming from yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I think it has been enlightening in the sense of understanding your position for sure. You know, I have a much better understanding of it now than I than I did when, you know, when I would just check out a couple of your sermons. But um, I, I would say, you know, I, I don't really ever say that we don't understand how they come together. It's not that they come together. It's that they're of they're of one nature and one essence and one substance. And they literally, it says the father in me and, and the son, you know, and I and you and you and me and all these things that they're literally moving and living in, inside of each other. And they're as close as they can possibly be without being each other. So you never lose the distinction of the father, son and Holy Ghost, but they're just smashed together as much as you can be and inside their nature. I mean, it's just this one substance and nature, you know, they're all one. In that sense, it's the one God, but there's there's this tri-unity of being inside yeah. the one, you know? So it's not that the three equal one, because if I start saying that the Father is the Son, the Son is the Spirit, <laughs> we lose that distinction in the in you know in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's why, and this is sort of I guess my closing statement, so to speak, 
um, is that you know the the importance of the distinction of retaining you know Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as distinct and only referring to each individual person of the Godhead. Where whenever I say the Son, I'm clearly demarcating that I'm talking about Jesus. When I say the Father, I'm clearly demarcating according to the New Testament that I'm talking about God the Father and then the Holy Spirit, which is given un unto the church. And so I can't blend these titles together because it's actually not just a title, but it speaks of the triunity of that being that we're talking about. The one being who is in a, this triune form in the triune, the three Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are the one God. And so I see that as in, in plain scripture, in the New Testament, you know, that it says that Jesus is the Son over and over again, hundreds of passages, never attributing that sonship to the Father or Jesus as the Father, or, and, you know, there's never that true blending. There's a couple passages that we can debate of what it's saying, but the overwhelming evidence, I believe, is for the Trinity. I think you've given us some things to think about, though, Victor, and I do appreciate you coming on and sharing your views. It's given me some things to think about. So thanks for that. And uh, God bless everyone who's listening. And uh, just very importantly, thanks for your time. And I also appreciate you being willing to, to, to do a, a call. I think a lot of people are not willing to try and defend their views. And I think that's what's a bit disappointing about a lot of the people in this uh, new IFP movement is that they, they want to talk about you, but they they don't want to just face you and just have a chat, <laughs> just talk well, about it. None of them have ever approached me to talk to me, but they can rail on me all day, you know. But but anyway, that's a whole other topic. Right. I, <laughs> but we can always talk about the new IFB and, and other, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, man, I mean, that just opens up like a whole can of worms, you know, because we, we're, we're in so much agreement on so much. You know, yeah. Well, I think there are other things to talk about. Like one thing I didn't really get to is, um, you know, talking about Jesus, Jesus only baptism, right? That was so. There's still things for us to talk about. If you want to schedule another chat, we can, and we can do another live call. Yeah, we can. We can do that sometime. I, I only get enough time to do these every month, once a month, or yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be soon. It can just yeah. be any time. Yeah, but I definitely will. We can end it here, and then we can we can chat offline. Yeah, and I definitely appreciate, you know, the opportunity to have you on, even on, on some other topics, you know, even discussing maybe the new IFB or something and, and some of the uh, some of the differences between, let's say, your church, what you believe and what they believe, some of the differences between, you know, our church and our doctrine and what we believe. I think fundamentally we're aligned on, on a lot, but there's some, you know, there's some behavioral, you know, behavior issues and, you know, like railing and, and etc and different things that really have to be according to first corinthians 5 11 you either need to stop railing or you need to be kicked out of the fellowship of the church so yep. it's as simple as that you know but but anyway we can always discuss uh you know different things i i'm, I'm glad that you don't deny the three i think there's some there's a paradox in your view, in your view and the question is is God paradoxical uh, but we you know we've kind of gone over that and and uh, but I do welcome that I would just end with this please pray for us pray for our churches pray for uh, you know pray for the the gospel to go forward keep us in prayer because the devil is always attacking and trying to destroy and uh, so we can always use your prayers you know for our families and, and for our ministries. Uh, so people listening, do please keep us in prayer. And uh, I pray that God blesses you all. And uh, hope this was edifying for those listening. Good night.